justice for all. All right. Uh, item one, adjustments to the agenda. And I have one in communications. I have a thank you to add. Are there any other adjustments to the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on to item two, approval of the school board minutes from recent meetings. May I have a motion? I move we approve the school board minutes from executive session Tuesday, September 9th, 2014, our regular business Tuesday, September 9th, 2014, executive session Tuesday, September 23rd, 2014, and workshop Tuesday, September 23rd, 2014. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. All right. Is there any discussion? Questions? Comments? Actions? Okay. All those in favor? Seven zero. Uh, item three, comments from our student representatives. We have Sierra Bates and Natalie Ballon. Uh, one topic that I thought was worth mentioning was that um, I've been approached by several juniors over the past couple days inquiring as to the possibility of juniors leaving campus during their freeze. Um, in high school during campus and um, most of us have our licenses and so a lot of juniors were wondering that whether it would be more beneficial for us to be able to leave like the seniors rather than trying to find somewhere to go in the high school during our freeze. So I thought that was worth mentioning. <laughs> so. um, and we just so know on last week we had homecoming. It was really successful and fun. I think everybody had a good time. And then this Friday, or excuse me, and this Friday night we have um, home and which is pretty rare at the high school. Um, on a more academic note, I just wanted to give a little shout out to the um, math department, particularly Mr. Rio. He has flipped the classroom, and that means that you do the lectures at home. You watch um, videos teaching you the math, and then you come into the classroom and you do the homework and the problems with him in small groups. And that's been a very interesting, interactive way to learn. I think it's cool that our school has done something like that. Uh, and then Student Council is uh, sponsored, and the HSPA is sponsoring Michael J. Chase to come to our school. He's a kindness leader in the country. and. This is kind of a school climate project and I just want to let you guys know that was going on. I think it's it's the Wednesday before Thanksgiving break, so you're all welcome and invited to come. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments for student representatives? So I would just say Natalie in res res in response to what to, to to juniors, what school board members will always tell you on this kind of thing is that we would we would turn and ask uh, building administrators you know how that how that you know, about that issue uh, so what I do is encourage you also to work with um, the building administrators um, to you know if that's something that's important to, to students that, that, that you speak directly with building administrators about it and then because they're in a better position than we are to understand all the implications that may be involved with that kind of thing. Mr. Shedd, absolutely. So I spent a day with you speaking earlier today. I've had a number of juniors, and maybe I'm giving them this information, but I've actually suggested that they go through the school board because right now the senior off campus privilege is granted in the school board policy. Um, as a junior three, Right, and so then. Uh, it, we would probably be more likely to <laughs> if you were going to bring that issue forward. As policy chair, I'm making notes. Okay. Yeah, so if it's a matter of if it's a matter of school board policy, which it appears to be, then uh, then that's something that our 
policy committee would take a look at, but the policy committee would also work closely with administrators to, to, to uh, un understand uh, the implications. And, but that said, we love hearing from students about you know, how, to make, uh, how to make school a better place. So thanks, thanks for the input, I appreciate it. Just to follow up on that, so how, <clears throat> just because we do want them to bring forward ideas, um, so how might that work? Would, um, if she had a group submit a, you know, policy review request, just, I, would, I, I just want to give her tangible next steps, so how well, might. I would suggest that the student council or the junior class, whoever is most appropriate, send a letter to the school board policy chair requesting a review of policy JHCA, which is the policy that pertains to use of unscheduled class time, I believe it's called, for high school seniors. <coughs> and that will officially allow the policy chair to add that to an upcoming policy agenda for discussion, and we would certainly invite students to attend that meeting when the time comes. Thank you. So <laughs> hopefully that doesn't sound that just that doesn't sound just like a whole lot of red tape. I think what we're tr what we're trying to get at, and thank you, Michael, is we're trying to get you know we're trying to help uh, make sure that you're you're you know you you understand the process for moving the request forward. So. Yeah, I can talk to the um, junior student council and see if that's something that they. I'm sure that's something that they would be willing to do. So yeah, I can talk to you about that. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, moving on to item four, comments from the public on agenda items. I'm guessing we're not going to get comments from the public on agenda items tonight. Um, so I'll move on to item five, communications, and um, I'll start, I want to start with a thank you. Um, so tonight is the last televised meeting of our school board term, and I wanted to take a moment to thank the school board leadership team, Elizabeth Seifries, Vice Chair, Michael Moore, Finance Committee Chair, and Joe Morrissey, Policy Committee Chair. Um, research indicates that school boards in highly effective school districts remain focused on four key areas of board responsibility, establishing vision and goals for the district, developing district policy, allocating resources, and assuring accountability. This, this team, this leadership team, have, has kept the board on that focus. As Vice Chair, Elizabeth Seifries has helped to keep the board from straying from these goals. As a board representative in the strategic planning process, Elizabeth brought insight, vision, and invaluable listening skills to a stakeholder group of teachers, staff, parents, students, and administrators. As an educator herself, Elizabeth holds all district staff accountable to the same high professional standards. As chair of the Finance Committee, Michael Moore has led a focused and efficient budget process, widely praised as clear and coherent. He's also worked closely with the Town Council to create a 10-year facilities plan that provides long-term financial st stability and supports the upkeep of our town's valuable physical assets. And as Policy Committee Chair Joe Morrissey has brought discipline, wisdom, and considerable professional experience with youth issues to the work of writing district policy. Notably, she has helped to create a substance policy that sends a clear message to students that substance use in school is not okay, while aligning the district roles in violations with its strengths by focusing on education and inclusion rather than punitive measures. It has been an honor and a pleasure to work with each of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tom. Thank you. Those kind words. You're welcome. Uh, so now we'll go to 5A um, to Jonathan Warner. So Jonathan Warner is not here. I resisted the urge to project a picture of him at the BAMI Awards onto the screen behind me. Um, but I'll just share a little bit about the recognition that Jonathan received. Jonathan, um, for those of you who don't know, is our, one of our middle high school 
um, library integration technology specialists, library and instructional technology specialists, pardon me. Um, and Jonathan was one of five national um, finalists for the Librarian of the Year Award. So I'm going to read something from his principal, who's not here either. Jonathan, by the way, would love to be here, except he chose to go with his children to see the author of the book Wonder, Patricia Polacco, at Books a Million uh, in Portland, in South Portland tonight. He has his values in the right he, he, Clearly, he does. So this is... Um, from his middle school principal. Jonathan is a dynamic, passionate, and dedicated educator who cares deeply about students, embraces technology, and remains intensely focused on pedagogy when using technology to enrich instruction. He is co-organizer of, yes, this is a, I'll, I'll share it with you later, but it's an ed tech chat, Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern. I'll, the blogspot link is connected, so we'll post this for you on the website, where he maintains connections with educators around the world about technology and education issues. He also has his own Twitter page with over 1,500 followers and his own blogspot, mainschooltech.blogspot.com, on which is this quote from Jonathan, which sums up his focus about linking to mission. If the teaching and learning doesn't serve that mission, it doesn't belong here. And if the technology isn't advancing, improving, enhancing the teaching and learning and the mission, it doesn't belong here either. Jonathan has been instrumental in transforming our library into a thriving and exciting library and learning commons in partnership with Amanda Kazaka. He does outreach with students and teachers throughout the day and offers boot camps or orientation sessions to help parents understand and navigate the use of student iPads. I'm thrilled John Jonathan was nominated and then a finalist for a BAMI award. I couldn't be more pleased and appreciative of his contributions to our school and district. There's a side note that he's often known to burst into song. And some of you may have seen him perform uh, last year in our all school concert where he played a pivotal role. Yeah, he was great. Um, just in addition from one of his colleagues, Amanda Kazaka at the middle school, Jonathan was nominated for his work on a national level, conference presentations and social media presence. His networking on behalf of technology and learning earned him this attention and recognition from his ISTE peers. So again, he was one of five finalists for the 2014 BAMI Awards and was able to attend a special celebration in Washington, D.C. These awards are given yearly by the Academy of the Education, Arts and Scientists, Sciences. Every finalist is was selected, this is from the BAMI Awards webpage, because they are either world-class collaborators, made significant, have made significant contributions to the field, or have modeled the valued quality of a 21st century educator. Selection by the Board of Governors is a noteworthy distinction recognizing Jonathan's contributions. Jonathan could just as easily have fit into the teacher or school technologist role because he fills those as well, but he's also a school librarian who alerts everyone when it's National Poetry Month, who posts the school's happenings on the Cape Elizabeth Library website, and who recommends books on his own personal blog. Rather than struggling with the changes in school libraries, Jonathan is excited by them, especially those happen in Cape, happening in Cape Elizabeth schools where they're transforming libraries into learning commons. So those are just some comments from his colleagues, but we are very proud of his accomplishment. That is a great honor. Yeah. Congratulations to Jonathan. Uh, okay, item 5B, <coughs> the draft of the 2015-2016 school year calendar, always the most controversial evening of the year. Notice how early you're receiving this draft. Mm. So included in your board packet along with the draft is a memo um, from the Commissioner of Education, James Ryer. And I attended a meeting with Commissioner Ryer in early September along with colleagues from several neighboring school districts because we were um, given a strong warning from the Commissioner of Education that if we as a regional group of sending schools to the Portland Area Technology High School did not get our calendar in line, um, but the state would potentially withhold subsidy for coming years. So a group of seven of us um, from all of the sending schools met to put together a draft calendar that would comply with that state law so that we are not jeopardizing future funding. That draft is included. Um, I'm not asking for adoption tonight. This is a first look. I'll be sending it out to faculty and scheduling those meetings um, as well. But essentially, we have very limited flexibility in the days, the common days that we have off from school. State law requires um, no more than five 
dissimilar calendar days, and that's across all the school districts. So that means we have to work pretty closely together to align our vacations and um, professional development days. And I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thanks for doing that. I can't imagine um, how that was in the room and the amount of paperwork that was in front of the seven of you. Um, and what a great thing to support the to align us with PASS, which is a very, it's a fabulous program. Um, so, thanks for doing that. I did wonder about the orange. I noticed the orange and half days right away. Yes. Um, that's, we haven't done that for a few years. We do have that on our calendar this year, in this current year, so that would be a continuation next year if this is ultimately the recommended calendar. Are there other major changes from this year's calendar? Well, the most notable changes, this year we have um, two professional development days immediately prior to Thanksgiving. Right. Mm -hmm. That is not the case in most of these other sending districts. Um, so we had to try to figure out, again, collaboratively, some possibilities for common days. In some districts, that is right now sort of negotiated by contract when the days are. For example, there's a professional day scheduled in January. In one of those sending districts, that is a contractually required day. So we had to look at different pieces. So that's one example. Um, this year we have two full weeks off at the December break for the timing of the holiday. Um, but next year, if that's not the case, we'll be in school the Monday, Tuesday. I, I will tell you that every district has had to make some concessions at given trade. There are school districts that can't contractually start before Labor Day and other districts that do start before Labor Day because they have you know, IB and AP exams that they're concerned about squeezing in as much instructional time early in the year. So every district gave a little bit in putting this draft together, and this was the <coughs> best effort to come up with something that would fit most districts' needs as a starting point. So we're circulating our common draft um, early in order to um, have an adopted calendar, hopefully for a common, no less than five, or no more than five summer instructional days common calendar adopted this year. So if I'm reading this calendar correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, our first day of school is a week before no. Labor Day, the 31st of August. And Labor Day is the 7th. I'm sorry, the, of yes, September. you are correct about that. But it also seems that that would be a late Labor Day. This it is Labor the latest day. possible Labor Day. And I am told that from the historian on the leadership team that it was not uncommon on years such as that for Cape Elizabeth to start school prior to Labor Day. So just for those reading that for the first time. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. Because I know a lot of stand out. families try and squeeze in that last bit of some yes. fun. But it just seems like an unavoidable click of the calendar. And this will be the practice that goes on for future years. The common calendar work certainly work because that, as long as that law is in effect, there's going to be work to do in districts. Uh, the commissioner has made it quite clear that we will withhold subsidy if we are not. So then, an effort. to follow along, because I know that this is a big deal for families, it would be more likely than not that we will continue to start school before. Um, this is the l Labor Day will be earlier. <laughs> In subsequent years, this yeah, is the latest possible on. way that Labor Day can be held, so I can't tell you that that would always be the case. Okay. It's going to depend. Because Labor Day is the 7th of September, it's late. It, it was late, which would mean school wouldn't get out instead of the scheduled date in this draft. Of, 20th. Can you even see it? Sorry. The, the 20th of June. The 20th with five snow days, which would then be the 27th if you had five snow days. I, I just anticipate a lot of conversation. Absolutely. Sure. I'm hopeful that people re will remember that, I mean, it, it varies year to year depending on how late Labor Day is. I'm hopeful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to item 5C, the strategic, strategic plan indicators of success. For those of you following the strategic planning process, we've been working on uh, measurable 
metrics which we'll, which we'll be able to use to track our success against the plan. Um, and that work has been ongoing for some time. And um, I'll turn it over to you. In fact, I think you saw the first draft of measures last February, if I'm not mistaken. And so some work has gone on since then, based on some feedback that we received, um, both from faculty um, in our schools, as well as from community members, the school board, and members of the leadership team as well. So we sent back that draft put it back to work. We had a workshop in May where we spent some more time, collected some more feedback, talked about um, these particular areas. The leadership team then spent some time working on them during our retreat over the summer. Took them back to the faculty for comments this fall. And this is the draft that you now have in front of you. <coughs> and, and just so, so that it's clear that these are, these are measurable goals it will take programs and initiatives to ensure that these these things happen and those programs and initiatives some of them are in place and some of them will be developed and put into place at a later date exactly and i'm happy to kind of walk through these a little bit just to give you a little bit of background and try to answer some questions as we go along if you look at the first one some of the feedback we received was that it seemed like academic measures were the primary focus, which seemed to conflict with some of the discussions we had about mission, vision, and values. So we consciously moved some of the other indicators forward to really take a look at the whole child, um, whole student. So the first one really centers around passion and interest and looking at what are individual students after. So it's looking to have a system in place to help students identify those passions and interests to, through examination of strengths and growth areas and to tailor learning experiences to cultivate those areas. So some of the experiences that we're talking about, some of those are already in place but uh, for some students. Um, but the list includes internships, service learning experiences, dual enrollment courses, which are courses where you earn high school credit as well as college credit simultaneously for the same course. And just to speak to that one briefly, we're looking at piloting a dual enrollment course with SMCC in as early as this coming spring. Online courses, and we have a number of students every year who take online courses for credit for different reasons. Sometimes it's, it's because they can't put a course into their schedule. Sometimes it's to catch up on a course. They might want to advance in a particular area. Independent studies and extended learning opportunities, which is essentially a catch-all phrase for um, designing experiences that might be community-based, work-based, where you're connecting those experiences with the curriculum and standards that, that are intended to be learned. And our goal is to increase student involvement and again, this is the draft uh, by at least 10 students each year. The second goal, or second indicator, pardon me, by June 2017, students will regularly have the opportunity to pursue areas of passion and interest for inclusion in their electronic portfolios. These in-depth research projects will be done in collaboration with supporting adults and will align with proficiency standards for core academic areas. So again, building in opportunities for choice and voice, essentially. Number three, back to some of the academic pieces. We're looking to have 95% of our students, and it says assess students, that's because we have standard assessment measures in place at certain grade levels, not at every single grade level, um, based on the way that some of the um, state assigned assessments have been conducted. But we're asking for them to demonstrate a year or more growth in writing, reading, and mathematics across those data points. And you'll see that we've included some baseline measures, which again is part of the feedback that we received from, from folks. Writing, you'll note there's no growth data available for writing at this juncture. So we'll be working on that as we move forward. Part of the reason for that is because writing is assessed typically at grades five and eight, and it's hard to measure growth over a four year period. <laughs> you need a more connected relationship there. Uh, 
Um, and again, we feel based on our um, current performance that that 95% is realistic for um, students across the board. The other area, and this is one we've spent some time talking about, is closing the academic gap in reading, writing, and mathematics for what we're calling underperforming students. And there's a little footnote about what that means. Um, underperforming students is a catch-all phrase, but in our particular context, we're talking about our students with disabilities who, for whom there's data provided where to, that shows that they significantly lack behind their peers in performance in those areas as well as for our students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged according to um, federal free and reduced lunch guidelines. And again, we look at our local context. Our boys were significantly underperforming their female counterparts in writing. So those are some of the areas that we're targeting in terms of closing um, the achievement gap. Questions about those first four? Shall I take a sip of water? Um, in uh, not only really questions, but for one and two, um, mm -hmm. it, it seems important to remember um, when we're when we're talking about the indicators of, of success to think beyond or even before high school. Mm -hmm. It seems a lot of the idea is that um, your internships and uh, other things. The first people you think of are the high school students, but you know that the importance of generating these ideas. Or earlier grades as well. Absolutely, and I would say, you know, right now we have middle school students who are taking online courses for different reasons, yep. or you know, potentially completing independent studies for different reasons. And service learning is a part of the middle school experience for students. So I absolutely agree with you that these are opportunities for all kids. And while this list sounds more secondary, extended learning opportunities, that catch-all phrase, can apply really at any level. Yep. Are the online courses, we, we, have, we already have, the online courses are not to do with the charter of online schools, virtual schools that are happening, but this is, we already have a relationship with the online program. So there are a number, um, and it really depends on what the particular course needs are, and we look at those on an individual basis. There used to be a virtual high school collaborative, essentially, I'm not sure if that's the right term, um, that existed in the state of Maine. That hasn't been around, so at least since I've been here, I think a year or two before that, uh, that, that disbanded, but the state had installed some technology infrastructure in schools around the state, and there was a policy, actually, that we deleted um, that spoke to that. Uh, but we don't have a particular isolated partner relationship with virtual charter school. That's a, or, or not a virtual charter school, but with, a, with an online school per se. Those are definitely options. There are some subscription options. But again, you have to look at, do you have the number of students participating in order to make that financially worthwhile? And do they offer all of the courses that we might be interested in, or students might be interested in taking? Because what the a lot of this has already been happening, so what we're doing is we're documenting what's already been going on. There are already been kids who have been taking classes at USM as sophomores, juniors, seniors. And so really, we're getting better at what our community is doing, and then encouraging, um, allowing other people, families to um, make choices. Yeah, and I think what we're recognizing is that in the 21st century, there are a lot of different ways to learn and that there are a lot of opportunities available to students. And some of those occur within the typical day, and some of those might occur and within the typical day and within the typical school, and some of those may occur outside of that. And that you know, in order to keep learners engaged and motivated and help them be ready to succeed in the world that's waiting for them, we need to be flexible. I have a question about um, number three. Clearly number four is, is, is about closing the achievement gap, but isn't number three also about, doesn't that serve to close the, the achievement gap as well in that we're, you know, if, if kids, if, if for example in mathematics, we're seeing 79% of kids showing overall growth year over year. And if we want to increase that to 90, 95%, isn't it likely that the, the, those, those kids in that, in that last 16%, those are, are kids who are underperforming? They would probably fall into that yes. category of underperforming students. They would, but I will say it's different is that if they fall in that category of underperforming students, making a year's growth isn't enough. 
they're not going to catch up unless we're accelerating their learning by offering things like summer programming, looking at other opportunities, other additional time and opportunities for them to learn and grow. So it, Which is why we need number four as well as number three <coughs> in order to accomplish the goal of closing the achievement gap. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on to the next set. Um, number five, by June 2018, every course will have a written curriculum that identifies learning targets with connections to Maine's learning results. So again, Maine's learning results, there are questions that we received about well, why doesn't it say the Common Core, what are Maine's learning results. Maine's learning results include the Common Core standards for English language arts and mathematics, but they also include standards for social studies, the arts, health, science, um, science not is not yet, but will soon be the next generation science standards. So all of these pieces are part of the main learning results. And again, this gets back to you know, an issue that we have talked about in the past, which is that of identifying the curriculum cycle so that we are maintaining that work over time. And it's a challenging thing to do when standards continue to change and evolve. So, that is number five. Number six, each, by June 2018, each student will maintain an electronic portfolio demonstrating transferable knowledge and skills, including the embedded use of technology tools and concepts of digital citizenship. That does not mean that we're going to wait until the 2017-18 school year to collect pieces of evidence from students in our schools, but it means that it will be 2018 before we have a complete system by which we're collecting data from every student in all of our schools. Part of that has to do with um, storage. You know, right now our e-backpack system is great for our students in grades seven through 12, but that isn't available on a one-to-one -one basis for students in grades K through six to store and archive um, pieces of data. Number seven, by January 2017, at least 85% of middle and high school staff and students reported a survey and an anecdotal focus groups that derogatory and intolerant language is unusual to hear in Cape Elizabeth High School and Middle School. That work centers around our climate work that we, that we talked about last year in a, workshop, a joint workshop with Steve Wessler. That's the work that tells us kids are feeling like a, our schools are a safe place to be, a place to take risks, a place to learn, where they're feeling supported and respected and connected. So we don't currently have data on that particular question because we haven't asked it, but we are asking it. We will be asking it this year when we um, conduct our climate survey. We can't use Steve Wessler's um, information on that workshop. Well, I think we, we aren't, okay. because we didn't ask all students, okay, great. we only did some focus groups. So we want to ask all students and do focus groups this year. Thank you. Do number eight, and then I'll stop again. Um, annually, beginning in December 2015, at least 90% of students will report that they feel connected and well-supported by at least one adult in school. Again, that's one we've talked about quite a bit. It has to do with students feeling connected and supported, which is a necessary condition in order for them to be successful. We did have survey data on that particular issue last year. It's one of the ones we shared when we shared our survey results last spring. But roughly right now, 75% of our students across middle and high school say that they feel connected to adults and well supported. So we're looking to increase that over the next couple of years. I'll stop there. Are questions on this? Other questions on the next one? So I have a quick question on number six. Um, each student will maintain an electronic portfolio demonstrating transferable knowledge and skills, including the embedded use of technology tools and concepts of digital citizenship. Is that something that the students will be maintaining for themselves, or is that something that we provide them with a portal to fill back from their own work? Yes, both and, if, if that helps. I mean, I think ultimately, and, and we don't know exactly what this is going to look like yet, honestly. That's work that, as John described earlier, we still need to do. Um, but I, I would say that you gradually begin to take ownership of a portfolio and to understand the benefit of what a portfolio has to offer. You gradually begin to understand who you are as a learner and to 
to understand which pieces of your work are going to show the best evidence of your learning. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're, it's kind of a gradual release model, in other words, where you're helping students, perhaps in a one-on-one -on -one discussion, look at some of their work and decide which pieces belong in their portfolio and helping them to be reflective about that process. So it could be a repository for things like community service projects that they've committed or um, you know, doing volunteer opportunities in the community. So it would end up being a repository for things that students could then look back on in their senior and junior year as they're looking beyond high school um, as a way to help round out their school transcripts. And lots, lots. There are many colleges and universities mm -hmm. that accept digital portfolios and digital submissions and it's, you know, look at those as part of a student's whole package. So, I, you know, I, I think part of presenting yourself in the 21st century is presenting yourself digitally and learning which artifacts are going to best represent you. They could be videos, they could be a piece of writing from when you were in first grade and a piece of writing from when you were a junior in high school and looking at who you've evolved into as a writer. Um, so, it, it, yes, it could take many forms. Has there really cool potential? So, number five um, looks to me like it would be kind of an essential step as we prepare for the proficiency based diploma. So. And it's articulated in our strategic plan as something that we need to do. And yes, it does absolutely connect to that work. And I just want to make one more plug for number H, where we say 90% of students should feel connected. I believe that we should shoot for the stars and say that we need to have at least shoot for 100% of students to feel connected. Shooting for anything less, to me, is leaving that other 10% out. And that, that's just sad. I think that we need to at least shoot for the stars at the end of it 90%. At least we can say we're trying. Okay. I know. I'm broken. I don't know. But I'm not. I, well, we're starting in 2015. I think we should be doing it now. Oh, and I think most of our administrators and teachers do, but I think we should codify that and say 100%. Okay. Duly noted. Thank you. You're welcome. Moving on, number nine, by June 2017, all students will receive feedback from adults concerning their academic, social, and ethical behavior, reflecting student growth connected to the main guiding principles. The main guiding principles are linked here, but again, those are looking at um, being responsible, <laughs> respectful, um, ethical, and connect to our value of ethics. And I'm pointing behind me because the poster's over there and I can see it out of my periphery. <coughs> Number 10, beginning in 2016, students will have the opportunity to provide feedback to their teachers and administrators regarding classroom instruction, culture, and community. So we're doing part of this already with our, oh, I have extra copies, Kate. Yeah. I'm sorry. We would yeah. have to do that here. I ended up with a packet with only one page. Thank you. Have more. Does anybody else see one? We're good. Yes. We're good. Okay. Thanks. I apologize. It beats this. So we're already collecting some, some of that information from students with respect to um, school culture and climate. But this is also looking, at, and we have a little bit of data around instruction, but this is um, hopefully opening that up a little bit further. Number 11, annually beginning in 2014. Note that is a, has already occurred. Staff will have the opportunity to provide feedback to building and district administrators regarding district climate, culture, and professional support. So again, that speaks to the survey um, that we started work with last year around um, school culture and climate. And number 12, coincidentally, falls right along that same vein. Annually beginning in 2014, parents will have the opportunity to provide feedback to the district regarding engagement and satisfaction with school programs and services. So again, these are surveys we began last year, so we have some baseline data on those, but we want to make sure that we're continuing that process and continuing to evaluate ourselves and, and see how stakeholders are feeling about the work. I'm going to do the last two just because those three overlap quite a bit. 
By June 2017, at least 15 percent more students will give positive responses related to questions about engagement, interest, and challenge in their work. And I, there's a group of questions from the student survey, um, and of which the average is 48 percent. So we're looking to increase that as we move forward. And number 14, last measure on the list. Beginning in the 2015-16 school year, implement a professional growth process that provides regular feedback and supports teachers and administrators in reaching individual and district goals. Questions on the last group? For number nine, um, on, regarding the feedback from adults concerning academic, social, and ethical behavior. What do we imagine that feedback will look like? Is that going to be um, just, you know, on a different spot on the report card, or is it going to also involve casual, dis you know, conversations, or? I, again, I would say probably both and. Mm -hmm. We don't have the specific tool in place yet. We know what the main guiding principles is asking us to evaluate. We know what we've identified as important traits that we want individuals to hold as they exit our schools. Uh, there are a number of already developed skills out there. Many of you have heard probably of Eleanor Duckworth's work around grit and some of those scales that exist that are used um, in places like the KIPP schools. Main guiding principles list exists that has uh, you know, its own set of traits. So it's sort of codifying those into what's the most appropriate list. But yes, I think students should receive written feedback as well as, well as mm -hmm. you know, individual conversations about how they're doing in those areas. And I think I wanted to make a plug for um, adults to include everybody, not just teachers and administrators, but bus drivers and ed tech and lunch staff and everybody because everybody is part of that educational experience. Thank you. Other comments? Just a couple small ones. Uh, I, I want to follow up on Elizabeth's point. Uh, it says adults. When I first looked at that, I was wondering if everybody's parents going to give every kid I assume that the adults is connected to adults within the school district in some fashion. Thank you. And I, I like the way you brought it, Elizabeth, but when I first saw adults, I thought, I don't much been telling me about my kid, except for a teacher or whatever, although they can't anymore. Uh, on number 11, just for the public, um, it uses the phrase building and district administrators. Um, I think the staff knows who they are, but basically building district administrators are the principals, assistant principals, and school district administrators are superintendent as well. Uh, so just when you hear building and district administrators, the layperson doesn't necessarily know who it is, the staff does. That's but. a good point. And I would say district administrators also include our food service director, um, Peter, building. and our facilities and transportation director. So it's. It's an extended I, I, I list. didn't want to try to list marks. No, no. I forget somebody, but um, fair point. Training. How are we going to do training to help everyone with these positive conversations and hard conversations? Like one rule as a teacher is you give 17 good things for the one hard thing. I don't know how okay that I am as a teacher, but what's you know how do we? So, so remember that these are only the indicators. Are, are we moving on the path to achieve the mission and vision and values that we established as a community a couple of years ago? So you looked at a much longer document earlier in the spring that has lots of initiatives and talks about action steps in lots of different areas. Those are the pieces. But what will they require? They're going to require time. They're going to require resources in terms of sometimes financial support, right? Online courses aren't free. And then we have to, we have to make sure we're budgeting appropriately for things like that. Um, they do require professional development time and, and there's a cost to that. It's a, there's a cost for teachers being out of the classroom or for having teachers come in and for additional time over the summer. So, so there's a lot of ongoing work around that. I think we'll be you know, making budgetary recommendations and connecting them to these pieces as well as the action plan pieces that we've outlined. And I expect that you'll see this continuing to move. You know, we talked about um, 
when we brought forward the draft strategic plan about reporting, ongoing reporting about how we're doing in some of these areas. So I would expect that we're going to be talking about it a lot. You know, if, if this is what we have said, if that, the mission, vision, and values are what we have outlined as where we want our students to be, and this is how we're going to tell if we're moving along that pathway, then we need to make sure that we're talking about it and checking our, our progress. David? Um, I just thought another point about 11, uh, about staff that provide feedback to building and district administrators. It seems we're missing one link in the food chain. We've got students to teachers administrators, we've got staff to building and district administrators, but we don't have uh, building administrators to district administrators. And that might be uh, sort of leadership team to the administrator. I, I don't know what the right words to use, but the building administrators to we'll get the central provide, office. Central office or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that would be the last link in the chain. Yep. Just a suggestion. I read that as included in there, but well, it, it says staff will have the op staff will have the opportunity to provide feedback to the uh, building and district administrators. It doesn't say that the building administrators can provide feedback to. The it's not explicit. Right. Other questions? Um, um, so, I I would I would say that the the. It was two years ago we, we, as a community, set out to write a very beautiful and ambitious mission vision statement, which is there. Uh, and the, the members of the, the school board have been tough, um, uh, tough adherents to, uh, to that mission and vision in terms of trying to develop a strategic plan, which we, we believe really would begin to to realize that I think very ambitious vision and um, so we have not made this process any easier for uh, uh, administrators principal shed is here principal Hassan is here I know I know you have worked very hard in your buildings on um, developing these these metrics um, and um, and we've been we haven't made that easier for you. We, you've come to us and we've worked with you and we, we, there's been a lot of back and forth on this. And I'm excited about how this is, is coming together. I think there's some really, um, I think there's some really good, very exciting um, uh, um, metrics in here that will, that will be valid indicators of how well we're doing against, against that mission. Um, I'm excited to see um, the passion pieces, the internships and service learning, uh, independent studies and extended learning opportunities. We're, we're telling our students that we encourage that kind of work uh, and that's a really new new thing and it's, um, it's not an easy thing for administrators to embrace. It, 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 it widens the number of variables um, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a work experience, it's already uh, very challenging. And I appreciate um, your willingness to, to take that risk. Um, I, I, one of the most uh, difficult pieces was the ethical piece. How do you, how do you tackle a, a, a commitment to, to ethics in education, particularly at a public school? And I think um, this is done uh, very well here with the with um, the, the feedback from adults concerning social and ethical behavior um, uh, uh, through some a grit scale or, or that sort of thing, um, and also in terms of um, reducing the the uh, derogatory and, in, and intolerant language, which um, you know we all like to think doesn't exist, but we know it does exist in our schools. Um, Another piece here that I think is very exciting is, is the feedback piece. We're, we're inviting students to provide feedback uh, to, to their teachers and administrators. We're inviting staff to provide feedback um, to, to building and district administrators. We're inviting uh, parents to provide feedback. So we're, we're, we're embracing feedback as a, as a, as a way of, um, of uh, 
encouraging continuous improvement, and, and I think that's great. Um, and last but not least at all is, is you know, I think there's some tough, tough metrics here around closing the achievement gap. Many of us on the board were, were startled when we learned that students from certain cohorts um, were likely to do no better in Cape Elizabeth schools with all the resources that we have than they, than they would do in the average main school. Um, and we were committed to, to improving uh, achievement, student achievement for those, for those kids. So, um, so having been a tough critic, I want to thank you um, and, and thank the administrative team for the, for the work that you've done to, to, to pull this together. I, I know it has not been easy. Um, and I appreciate it. And I'll stop speaking. <laughs> yes. So we're not asking for this to be adopted tonight. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to sort of mull it over once again. I'd, I'd like to be able to put it on the November agenda for adoption with feedback received between now and then. Um, it will also be asking for community feedback. And again, I think this is a step. I, I think they're going to continue to be work to do. Anytime you are trying to move forward, the landscape continues to change in certain areas. And so, you know, while we hope it's a roadmap, while we hope it's going to tell us if we're moving in the right direction, I can't tell you that there won't be a time when we say, we need to take a look at number X because we don't think it's, it's telling us what we need to know or moving us where we think we need to be. And so I, I hope that you know, we see this as a continued dialogue, not the end game. Thank you. John, I just wanted to add, and I think back at, at the World Cafe that we were having at the high school cafeteria and you know, the very prophetic um, earthquake that we had that evening, <laughs> been looking that over, and sort of how this sort of maybe shakes things up for some people about how you look at the way we do business and shaking up the culture and not taking um, the status quo as the right or the right path to take. And again, I do want to mirror the enormous amount of work that you have all been taking up in the district, both as administrators and as teachers and just and, um, building team leaders. I know that this takes an enormous amount of effort for you to focus not only on all the other things that you need to focus on to do your daily chores, but then to also face the challenges that are thrust upon us from state and national standards that are coming down. But then to also think of the different ways in which we can enrich the lives of the students and our families within our district. We have an amazing high performing district. And in order to keep our district not only great, but not only good, but to move it to great is um, something that we can all hopefully embrace in this new strategic plan, and there's a role for everyone to play. And I'm really excited to see it come to fruition. So I want to also echo that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Karen, I'm unable to stop myself. <laughs> uh, I would just say what I think this reflects most of all is the commitment of this community to every child and to making sure that we are being flexible about meeting individual student needs and giving every student the opportunity to be successful and grow and you know move on to a great future. So that is good work. So moving on to item 5D. The superintendent's report. Okay. Well, I learned very recently, so I have one more letter, but I'm going to try not to stumble through, that our middle school phys ed teacher, Andy Strout, was named the 2014 Maine Association for Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance Hoops for Heart Outstanding Coordinator of the Year. So he's invited to attend a special banquet that's going on at their conference. But um, essentially, I think that means that he did a phenomenal job with student participation and fundraising and supporting the Hoops for Heart campaign. So congratulations to Andy. You can see it just about any day at the middle school. <laughs> so congratulations to Andy. An enrollment report was included in your packet. That's our October enrollment report. So it's not been officially verified as of yet. 
due to some technical challenges with the state. But you'll see that we are um, about 30 students below our October 2013 numbers. So again, not inconsistent with what, with what we were talking about um, during the last budget season. But another reason why we have reached out um, to have an updated enrollment study um, through planning decisions. And that process has, will begin as soon as the October 1 numbers are verified officially by the state. <laughs> we received also an announcement from the Maine Public Employees Retirement System that our cost contribution or our contribution rate for teacher retirement will increase from 2.65% to 3.36% in the next fiscal year. So our estimate of that is somewhere in the $50,000 range for the next budget cycle, but I just wanted to give you advance notice of that. That's the estimated increase? That's the, the estimate. estimated total. That is the assessed increase. The, oh, the total is about a 50, the increase is about $50,000. That's what you're asking. Is it the increase or the total? That's the increase is about $50,000. Okay. Check, you. you're welcome. We received an, our new buses, finally. We took delivery of those very recently, so they are now out on the road. Um, I do want to just address some ongoing challenges that we have had with transportation. We have been hard hit by um, some illness among our bus driver ranks, which has made it very difficult for us. We have a very limited number of spare drivers, and so we have struggled um, some days to keep routes going. We've had a couple of routes at Pond Cove in particular, our afternoon run, um, where we've combined routes in order to get students home as, as in as timely a manner as possible. Um, we have been recruiting and working collaboratively with some, part some neighboring districts to try to partner up to offer training. We have reached out to agencies across the state to try to recruit drivers. We've placed advertisements. It continues to be a challenge for us. We, have, we did have a new driver who started with us last week. Um, so he's been going through his training and is um, going to be driving independently as well. But it is an ongoing challenge, and not just for us, but for neighboring districts as well. So we appreciate the patience um, that families have shown through this time, because I know it is not easy to get information late in the day that your child may not be home on time. So. We apologize, I assure you, we are working really hard and trying to be as creative and collaborative as possible to get that moving forward. Um, we may well in the very near future, again in conjunction with some of our partner districts, be offering a bus driver training program um, through community services, but it is a difficult area. So I will say, as I did in my newsletter, if you know anyone who wants to obtain a commercial driver's license or who already has one and would like some additional hours, please contact us at the central office. Can you explain what is the process, especially for our crew when kids, when things happen, uh, when we call parents, when they, do they all know what the phone call? Well, <laughs> we have been sending information via email. Thank you for that question. And we have been sending it as sort of as early as we have known about the issue. So some days we know about that first thing in the morning. Some days we find out about that when someone goes home sick at the end of a day. Um, so we have done our best to get that information out as quickly as possible, but I know of at least a few situations where, you know, I personally have been in contact with parents where they have not had that information in a timely manner, and again, I understand completely the frustration. Um, we've worked pretty closely with Kelly and Greg's team in the transportation office. Greg Marl's team in the transportation office has been working with Kelly's team to try to coordinate getting those messages out, um, and we do our best to get them out quickly. And that's an ongoing conversation for us. Seeing scarecrows all around town, that's because Harvest Festival is coming up this weekend, sponsored by the Middle School and Pond Cove Parents Association. So it's Saturday from 4 to 7, if I am correct about the time. Middle school activities last until 8. Oh, middle school activities last until 8. That's right. And Friday night, the night before, is the homecoming dance at the high school. Included in your packet were also some assessment results, so I'll just briefly point those out to you. And again, what is MHSA? So that's the main high school assessment. <coughs> and main high school assessments are conducted every year. 
They include reading, mathematics, and science measures, uh, as well as writing measures, forgive me. And um, I, we are often asked about how do we compare with other districts, so we've included that information in your packet just for comparison purposes. You'll see that um, CAPE is outperforming our neighboring peers in basically all areas, or at least is right on par with them in all areas. So um, again, congratulations to our, our students and teachers on that continued work. And again, I think it's reflective of the effort that goes into teaching and learning every day. Can I comment on this? Um, I know we receive, there's a lot of different, uh, you know, metrics out there. On the school board, you hear things like, you know, uh, US News Report. There's all these different grading. Um, you know, there's different ways to assess it. So, you know, um, you know, sometimes we take our lumps that we may not show up as prominent versus other districts. But, you know, I think this is one where, um, you know, when we hear the bad news or we're not doing as well as others, this is one that we're doing extremely well. So I'd like to, I know it's just one um, data point. There's lots of different ones, but um, it, it was good to see. Um, not only how well we're performing, but um, the consistency of performance. If you go back for years at the high school and, and all these areas, um, you know, it's easy to say we're a high performing district, but it's um, due to the hard work of teachers and, and uh, the principals that it's, um, you know, continuing to perform well. So I'd like to thank, um, you know, the teachers, uh, principal uh, Shed. Um, and all those um, involved. So I know these can change, but um, it was good to see um, how, how well the high school is doing. So thank you, um, and thank the teachers for us as well. The next piece of data, which I, I only have our middle school results for, but was our middle school science assessment results, which again, levels three and four are the proficient or proficient with distinction categories. But again, you can see that a large percentage of our students in grades five and eight are proficient or above. Um, only 9% you know, of our eighth graders scored below proficient on the main science assessment in eighth grade, which I think, again, shows great work going on um, by our teachers in the district and, and by our students. The other piece of information directly behind that in your packet was information about our special education, or information, is information about our special education services. So our local Cape Elizabeth um, special education services are, meet all requirements um, from the Department of Education and that's a process they go through every year of looking at how we're doing in a variety of categories that are spelled out for you. Let's see, let me pick a good one. You know, are we evaluating all of our children within 45 days of receiving parental consent for the evaluation? That's federal law. You want 100% compliance? That's what we are after. Um, what else? Our fiscal audit, we just went through that. We talked about that when the auditors were here. They're looking at, um, and again, the areas here, you meet the requirements. You need assistance, you need intervention, or you need substantial intervention. So Cape Elizabeth Special Education Department is reaching the highest level um, of distinction that it can receive from the state. Questions about those? Don't want to forget those. So, Two other things I just want to speak to briefly. Um, one is an ongoing conversation at um, the middle school about a makerspace. So I've met a couple of times with um, Mike Tracy and some staff from the middle school. We are looking to turn the existing um, technology area, what used to be the wood shop in Cape Elizabeth Middle School, into what's called a makerspace. And a makerspace is essentially a, a space within a school that's set aside for creativity, engineering, um, science, technology, arts, engineering, mathematics. I'm sorry, can you repeat what you're calling it? A maker space. Maker, maker space. Okay. Yes. Thank you. 
Yes, and I'm happy to share, if you'd like more information about makerspaces, some articles that describe those. But um, again, it, the intent is for there to be a space within the school where you can go and explore with different materials, try some creative hands-on learning, design a project, you know, utilize uh, interesting materials to create something new. That space is currently used after school by our robotics program. We expect that usage to continue, but we're hoping to sort of open up use a bit during the day that it can be reserved by classes or be available to, for student use over the course of the day. So we'll be doing some work to kind of rearrange that space, get some consultation um, from some community volunteers about how to outfit that, and we'll be looking at some storage options and moving some of the materials in. But don't be surprised if you see a request for some donations of interesting things to utilize coming out in the near future. And then the final thing I wanted to mention is that our district innovation team will be having its first meeting next week, the 22nd, a week from tomorrow. We'll be meeting in the library learning commons at the middle school. And we have representatives from every school and Elizabeth is our board rep. And we have um, high school and middle school student representatives as well. So it's an, when on the 22nd, sorry, is it during the day? Or? It's in the evening, we're meeting from 5.30 to 7.30. And um, again, the purpose of this group is to try to help sort of bring forward ideas, encourage people to, in trying out those things that they've wanted to try out and look for some ways to be supportive of that. I anticipate that we may um, come back to you or I may come back to you with a request to utilize some funding to support some of those initiatives. And uh, right now, my anticipation of that is that we would ask to use some of the refinanced bond debt, perhaps a percentage of that $30,000 that we refinanced and were able to use this year to support some innovation. But we'll, we'll bring that proposal back to you in November. By that, just to clarify, you mean yes. savings related to the, the, the refinancing, refinancing of right. the older bond? Yes, I do. I'm sorry. Not retirement not of a bond. No. Not a new no, bond. No, no, no. None but, of the above. But savings <laughs> created <laughs> when we took advantage of lower interest rates and refinanced the existing bond. That is, in fact, what I am saying. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I appreciate everyone understood the clarity. That. Yes. <laughs> Good to make Thank you. Crystal clear. I think that's it. Oh, no, that's not it. I am not remembering very well this evening. Um, just want to acknowledge Pond Cove's open house on the 30th of September. It's the first time that all grade levels, K through four, were there in one night. And um, from Kelly, it was a fabulous spirit of full school community that garnered very positive responses from both staff and families. Our students at um, both the elementary and middle schools have completed the STAR Universal Screening Assessments in Reading and Mathematics that are new this year. At K4, general ed, um, Special Ed Math and Literacy Specialists are reviewing and analyzing data for those students to help determine some next steps. We have screening procedures in place for gifted and talented, so those screening meetings are coming up again at both um, Pond Cove and the Middle School in the next couple of weeks. I think that's it. Thank you. Are there any questions about the superintendent's report? No, okay. On to item six. Okay. Um, I definitely got a question if um, the fire marshal was um, aware, aware, and if the fire marshal had done the monitors of the um, open house. And I said, I'm sure that our administration follows all protocols and everything. But if, and that's the right answer, right? We can certainly um, discuss that at an upcoming emergency management meeting and make sure that the fire chief is comfortable with our open house procedures. That's right. Great question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, item six, um, new business and letter, starting with letter A, before we have a motion, we have to have a name. So we, we are looking for a, a school board volunteer. Um, I'll do it. I'll you'll do it. OK. <laughs> Therefore, may, we, may I have a motion? I move we appoint school board member Susanna Mizell-Hubbs to the MSBAs, which is Maine School Board Associations, 
Annual Assembly taking place on Thursday, October 23rd, 2014. Second. You technically need a, they want you to have a delegate and an alternate. Okay. Is there anyone willing to serve as the alternate? I'm happy to be the alternate. I'm going to go to the next day. So. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. I'll amend my motion to include one alternate and uh, Kate Williams Hewitt. Uh, is there any further discussion? I just want to thank you guys for standing up to do that. That's a good thing. It's Likewise. actually, I haven't done it every year that I've been on here. It's actually very interesting. You should read the res resolutions. And anybody here that has to read the resolutions in the packet if they have comments, because we're delegating authority to this delegate or the alternate to actually make to vote on these. So if you have strong views one way or the other on it, you should tell the delegate. And they're actually now doing something we started doing about two or three years ago because I was stuck up there with no authority to make some decisions by force everybody to do it. Um, and there's some very interesting topics there that you want to take a look at. Um, and there is a sort of an informal procedure uh, about how you can talk ahead of time to various people, which I'd be glad to talk to you both about several times. Um, on hot button items, um, I would talk to other school members, other school districts, and so it would be a coordinated effort. I'd try to find people from Northern Maine as well as Southern Maine if we really cared about one single issue. So that we, it wasn't just Cape Elizabeth standing up there arguing for something you had a cross section, which is really important. I won't go into all the little tricks you can, or excuse me, techniques that you can use, but I'd be glad to fill you in on it if you like. Thank you, and David. I cannot, I would volunteer, but I have another commitment in Connecticut. I can't be in Connecticut and Maine at the same time. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? All right, letter B. May I have a motion, Joe? No motion. Oh, sorry. May I have a well, discussion, Joe. Sure. Um, as chair of the policy committee, it's my honor to introduce <coughs> these policies for first read. Um, JJJ, co-curricular and extracurricular activities, eligibility, and code of conduct. <coughs> KLG, relations with law enforcement. Uh, and KLGR, relations with law enforcement procedures. Um, this actually rounds out a suite of policies that we have been spending quite some time reviewing um, in regarding student behavior um, codes and policies. <clears throat> um, we set out uh, a first batch of these back in June. That first batch um, includes um, policy JKD, and out of that first batch that we, we sent out in June for a first read, um, of those policies, the one with the largest substantial change is JKD, suspension of students. And I, I just want you to hold that thought as I walk through the policies that we're putting out for a first read, because those two sets actually intermingle, particularly in that area. <clears throat> so the co-curricular and extracurricular activities and eligibility code of conduct, um, JJJ, there are a number of changes that we are suggesting to put forth for first review, first read from the public, and we would love your feedback. Um, we added a link to the Maine Principals Association website so that um, there would be a clear understanding that a lot of those codes of conduct that we expect for our students aren't necessarily set by our district, but they're set by the Maine Principals Association for um, being able to be eligible for contests. Um, we. And more substantially, we removed um, an ineligibility requirement for in, uh, or ineligibility clause for those um, incoming freshmen based on academic eligibility. And Jeff, please help me clarify this if I get it wrong. But um, we felt, and, and Jeff brought to our attention, that um, the beginning of high school should be considered. It's already a huge transition stage for many of those students moving from eighth grade next to the upper building. And we wanted to be able to let those students start with a clean state slate and start on the right foot by including them in as many activities as possible, including, and very importantly, athletics, where they get that sense of team 
camaraderie and introduction to the culture in the high school. So by um, removing the ineligibility for academic reasons, but instead placing them on academic probation, where they can be watched carefully to ensure that they're making a, a smooth academic transition, but still allowing them to fully participate in that team um, culture that can ingratiate them with their students. And, and Jeff, on that particular issue, did I misstate, overlook, or? Please. Yes. So the, th the thrust of what you're saying is absolutely correct. But, I, but the particular change is actually a little broader than just applying to eighth graders. Um, so if you look on page two of six, I'm sorry, I apologize. No, page one, actually, it's page one. Right at the very bottom, uh, paragraph C of JJJ. Yes. JJJ, yes. JJJ, yes, I'm it's, sorry. There's the, yes. the packet for first reads. Start Am I doing the right thing? thing? I yes, think I'm doing are. the right thing. Okay. You're right on. So JJJ, uh, page one. So it's A2C right at the bottom. Is everybody with me? So. The first sentence is the key. A student failing two or more courses in one quarter is ineligible upon the issuance of report cards and for two weeks thereafter. So the board members may remember that under their current version of JJJ, students who either fail the last trimester, fail two courses in the last trimester of eighth grade or two courses in the fourth quarter of their high school year um, are ineligible to participate in sports for the entire first quarter of their next. next year of high school. So what the policy committee discussed and is recommending tonight is that that period of ineligibility be reduced from the entire quarter to two weeks for all students and actually grade in all high school students. Um, then there is a probationary eligibility procedure that kicks in where students' grades, their performance um, are checked on a regular basis to, to hopefully give the student uh, an incentive to keep their academic performance at a level that will cause them to pass their classes by the end of the next quarter. So, Thank you for that clarification because I would not want anyone to misunderstand that very important um, we also, in this policy JJJ, um, removed the list of defined activities that this policy pertains to. Um, and as a reminder that the school code of conduct applies whether or not you are participating in a co-curricular activity. And the consequences you face for violations may differ from those um, who don't participate in activities. But removing the list also helps clarify those activities that that may change from year to year. So moving forward, we're asking that each advisor, volunteer, or coach review um, this extracurricular code of activities and eligibility um, with their club or sport or activity. Um, we removed the clause that compels administration to investigate any credible information or reports that the board's policies have been violated. And we felt that this put our administrators in an impossible position. Um, we are suggesting the removal of loss of, um, as a consequence for violating any of the codes. Um, we are suggesting the removal as one of the consequences to be um, loss of captaincy, leadership positions, honors, awards, um, from all of the consequences, regardless of the number of violations. This ties back to our mission <clears throat> to make these policies a mechanism to get students the help that they need for substance abuse or other infractions when interventions work best, i.e. when our children are still young. This removal also helps keep the consequences closest to the protective factor of co-curricular programs, which is the desire to remain on the team, as well as recognizing that captaincies, leadership positions, honors, and awards are valuable assets in a young person's career 
and stripping them from those assets erodes the future potential of our students, which is the center and the counter to our philosophy of wanting our kids to learn from their mistakes and go on to succeed. What really matters is in the end is no captaincy leadership or awards means anything unless we help guide our youth towards seeking the help, not ducking um, over draconian policies that our community can then skirt around. Any questions or clarifications on the loss of captaincies or wards or um, leadership positions? Um, <clears throat> One of the most important assets that we can, um, we are able to afford in our district and we're lucky to have is the ability to send our kids to a licensed clinical um, drug counselor should they need that support and help <clears throat> by creating some of these changes in our JJJ code of conduct. Uh, we're hoping that we can then use these policies for what they're most intended best for, which is to refer our kids to our substance abuse counselor for screening brief intervention and or education, and if she deems necessary, referral for further professional counseling. So as I get back to um, one of the policies that were set out back in June in a first read, this ties into the policy change that we submitted for JKD suspension of students. Um, <clears throat> and in that particular change, and in um, the same spirit of which we're making these other policies to our behavioral codes of conduct and policies is um, a student who has a single suspension of two days or fewer during his or her high school career may request that that suspension be made null and void and removed from that student's educational record under the following conditions. Students must be a senior. Students must submit written request signed by the student and or his or her parent or guardian to the building administrator or principal. And the principal's decision as to whether to make that suspension null and void is final. <clears throat> if the student commits another offense subject to disciplinary, disciplinary and or other consequences after that request has been granted, the first suspension, suspension will still be considered in determining the consequences under the applicable board and policy procedures. And again, <clears throat> I particularly call that policy out that we put out for first read because it helps um, substantiate some of the other policy changes that we're trying to make as far as making our policies that are in regards to students' behaviors to be more of something that can be used as a tool to help our children learn <coughs> from our mistakes and not make it be so overly draconian that um, families and students would instead do all they can to avoid um, seeking help where they need it most. Um, and in regards to policy KLG relations with law enforcement, there are really no changes that we're putting forth um, in that policy for first read. Um, in policy KL, well, it's not a policy; it's a it's a procedure. The KL G procedural R relations with law enforcement. We are adding the phrase um, health and welfare to the description of what types of scenarios law enforcement um, are to be called into our on school grounds. This provides administrators with greater discretion on when law enforcement should be called without hampering them from doing what they feel is best for our students' safety. So those are the first, um, those are our three policies that we're putting out tonight for first read. Um, as I've mentioned before, these are complementary to the other host of first pol policies that we put out for first read um, on our June 6th, June 10th um, business meeting that evening. Those policies can be found um, on our district website under school board packets. Um, and I suggest and I hope then that everyone take a moment to look at all of those policies as a suite since they are so interrelated. And it is our hope that we can put forth all of those policies together for a second read and adoption by the board in November so that we can um, implement those policies fresh in our new semester when our students come back to school in January.
Questions? I, I, may have, I may have misheard you, Joe. Uh, when you were describing the suspension of students, um, we, we, it was brought into a single strike rule that, that if you have a single suspension, it can be expunged at, at the discretion almost the whole thing. But mm -hmm. I thought you mentioned a single suspension of two days or fewer. It's actually any single suspension. Did I mishear you? May have. Well, I was reading directly from what our policy stated. And that states a student who has a single suspension of two days or fewer. No, no that's stricken. Yeah, that's struck in our that's copy. stricken. Or stricken. Yeah, that's so many yeah I think you have an older version, but it, it did at one time say that. And at a my apologies. We've we been working on these policies for some time, oh, I, but I, your I, your point is correct that we. The policy committee's recommendation was to bring it forward as a single suspension. Right. I, and I just want to make no it clear limit. to the public that this has been going on since January. This, is, this has been At least. really well done. So the language that was struck was of two days or fewer. Right. So it, basically, because there's almost no suspensions that are two days or fewer except for very minor ones, and it was changed right. to, be, to give you a full single strike for any suspension. If, Correct. If, and, and as I recall, that discussion was um, a few days or fewer was stricken, but clearly the number of suspensions that are beyond two days were so also that it made no material difference. But to clarify, it should be a single strike rule regardless Correct. of Correct. suspension. I just, you, you had read it without the strike out. I was just trying to clarify it, that's all. Thank you for clarifying. Well, something I thought about for a while. My notebook of the various versions of each of these is really, I can't even get it in the notebook anymore. <clears throat> But I, I think people should realize that what Joe has read are significant changes. Although it's in our packet as a second read for tonight, it isn't actually a second read for tonight. It's just um, Joe did a nice summary. There's a lot of changes here that I, I think puts Kate at the forefront of um, uh, restorative justice as opposed to punitive punishment. And I think, Joe, you deserve enormous amount of credit for moving us in that direction and I hope people do read all of this. I've heard a lot of questions about it and I think the, these policies, the, sec, the, one, the ones you cited as well as the ones we first read tonight really move this district forward in terms of kids make mistakes and they'll, but they shouldn't be penalized forever for it and they, um, I, I think you've done a great job and I think the policy committee has done a great job in that regard and I think we're in the forefront of where we should be. Well, I, I do want to also give credit for credit is due. There were a number of meetings, both, you know, then Elizabeth was on the <laughs> I'll say, I have my hands are. <laughs> um, and then and Susanna took her place, and Kate has been slugging out with us all along. And of course, these policy changes could not have come to fruition um, with our, our ad hoc committee member, David, as well as of the many rounds of questions and going back to both the school board members, um, school, school representatives of the school boards, sending those back to the um, student representatives as well as to our district leadership team, Jeff, your um, input on these policy changes has been invaluable. So this was definitely something where I felt like I was just maybe corralling sheep. But um, it's come a long way, and I'm really proud of what we've put forward here. And you should be. an effort. Thank you, Joe. Uh, moving on to item 6C, uh, athletic and co-curricular staff nominations. May I have a motion? I move we approve the following athletic and co-curricular staff nominations as listed out in tonight's agenda packet 6C. So a second. Second. Michael might have beat you too. <laughs> I was oh, reading, I wasn't watching. Uh, all right. Uh, we had an opportunity in executive session, as we always do, to discuss personnel nominations. If there, if there are confidential personnel issues, that's when we address them. Um, uh, but is there public discussion around this slate of nominees? I would just like to thank all of the people who have stepped up to help our children in the district. Um, Greg Marles is in here twice. 
Um, I think other people have stepped up year after year after year and gotten better at, or I shouldn't say better, have brought the um, play in the relationship with students and families to another level. And, um, I also want to say that the feedback that we get from Jeff Thorak through the evaluations at the end of the season, those are the pieces of paper that we can really, if people have concerns about anyone, that they should do the, obviously talk to. What happens, Meredith, when someone needs to give feedback about a, a coach or an advisor? Or, so you but, start by talking with the coach or advisor. Yes. And if that, and at secondary level, obviously, we'd encourage the students to start that conversation with the coach or advisor, but if, you know, parents can also initiate those conversations, or if the student is struggling with that, parents should initiate those conversations. If you, the issue is not resolved for you, then you move on to the appropriate administrator, which would either be the athletic director, or if it's an advisor, it would be um, the building administrator. And uh, again, if that's not successful, then you move up to the central office to the, or athletic director to high school principal, building administrator to district administrator. So that's sort of the chain, and then the chain beyond that would be the school board. Great. And then what are other avenues in which players and parents can give feedback? Because I, I, I know that we had heard about um, players and, and parents able to fill out evaluation forms. I personally love evaluation forms. Um, it just provides one more layer of information. So how does that happen? So those are sub sent out by the athletic director to teams at the end of every season to basically the mailing list for the teams. And Jeff, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but are those they are did, they're sent electronically. Paper copies certainly can be provided if people request those. We, I, I'm not aware of any recent requests for paper copies. Most people tend to fill them out digitally. Um, those are submitted then anonymously returned to either the, the athletic office in this particular case, and then reviewed by the athletic administrator and are part of the evaluation process for our coaches. So it is really helpful feedback, and I know it's always difficult for people with the end of a season and many things going on and other family events, but that feedback does inform um, the work of our coaches who's put in lots of hours working with children in our schools. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? One zero. All right, item 6D, may I have a motion? I move we approve a proposed to kick with the high school world affairs council model UN team trip to Brown University in Rhode Island for November 7th through 9th, 2014. Is there a second? I second. Uh, and Meredith. No, I'll just briefly say this is the World Affairs Council Model UN team regularly makes trips to um, universities around. Um, Brown is one that they have visited in the past, so this is a kind of a recurring request. And um, full details of that are on um, the field trip sheet in your packet. Thank you. Are there any questions or discussion? Are all students involved in those programs eligible or, or able or somehow, you know? Yes, and typically what happens is they sort of divide up who the lead people are at the different competitions over the course of the season. So you might be a lead delegate at one and not at another. Any further discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you. Um, item 6E, may I have a motion? I move that we uh, consider Dr. Perez's request for an 18-day paid professional development leave beginning in May 2015 through the last day of school in June. Is there a second? Uh, all right, Aaron. So... This is a request that came forward from one of our staff members requesting to take a leave of absence at the end of the school year, um, requesting a paid leave of absence at the end of the school year to visit a school in India. 
Now, the contract, the teacher's contract per se, doesn't say, it says that teachers may request leaves of absence. It doesn't necessarily say paid leaves of, abs leaves of absence. It sounds strange to say that. I'm feeling a little tongue-tied. However, um, um, this request has been made because the um, requester, Dr. Perez, believes that it will be beneficial to students, that it's an opportunity to experience a different culture, to potentially bring back to the school district both the opportunities for a partner school relationship, as well as sort of um, further her own understanding and her work with students around um, behavioral challenges in particular. And she's asking the board to consider this request. Um, is there a history or precedent for um, paid professional development leave? So I would say that all of our teachers have the opportunities to participate in paid professional development days over the course of the year. Um, I would say on average that probably ranges from three to five days per individual staff member. Um, sometimes consecutive, sometimes not, but it might be that someone's attending a conference out of state for a few days in their area of specialty. Um, those are the kinds of requests that we typically receive. Will you explain the workload of um, Dr. Perez at this time that she would be leaving? So, a uh, school psychologist is um, typically involved in uh, planning meetings, uh, conducting observations, and conducting evaluations of students, as well as sometimes individual work, work supporting behavior plans, and the, the workload of a psychologist is kind of a revolving workload, I guess is the best way to describe it. Dr. Perez is here and can certainly add to that. Um, so uh, it's hard to project exactly what that workload might look like. I mean, sometimes that workload is a little thinner at the end of the year in the sense that it, um, students' time shifts a little bit at the end of the year. There are end of the year activities that are going on at the secondary level. You know, we have senior internships. There are a variety of activities going on at the end of the year. But the challenge is that I, you can't really predict what that workload might look like in a given year. It fluctuates. There are certain givens, you know, students whose evaluations are due to be updated. We know when those are due to occur and those can be scheduled and you can schedule those in advance and then there's always an unknown element of that work as well. It comes as things unfold. Uh, and, and we're speaking primarily about special ed programming and evaluations especially for which, like during a referral, there's a time frame, a pretty tight time frame. Um, so for initial evaluations, they ha initial evaluations are to be conducted within 45 days of the meeting where, the evaluation, where it's determined that an evaluation is necessary. Um, there can be agreements to extend that deadline, although I would say given the compliance requirements that have come forward from the federal government, those are few and far between. Um, with respect to re-evaluations, those essentially occur every three years, so we have a good window on knowing when those are coming and can plan ahead. I have a question. Um, if, if a request for an evaluation comes in um, just before, um, I guess before the request time of leave of absence, um, <laughs> And, and the first meeting happens, and then the evaluation has to happen with, within 45 days. How would that, I'm curious how that would be played out if one person starts the initial meeting and then is not there for the evaluation? So that certainly does happen from time to time mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons due to illness or changes. And yeah. um, at times, due to the workload, we contract for some support around evaluations. Mm -hmm. So. That alone, I would say, is not a particular issue. I would say, you know, the challenge becomes, are you able to complete that within the timeline? Let's less about who's conducting it then. Um, uh, where I thought you were going with the question was, do you have, is, does somebody else automatically pick up that evaluation? And um, typically, yes, <laughs> you it would say well, yes, but you might have to contract for someone else to come in and provide that evaluation. But I, I was asking that, but I'm also asking how easy is it to make that transition from one person at the beginning to a, a, a contacted person um, to finish? 
So again, I guess it depends on the process. And again, Dr. Perez can speak to this. I would say, you know, if you're already in the process of evaluating the child, that's probably more complicated, although there are different subtests that you conduct and, mm -hmm. and different assessments that you're conducting. So for one evaluator to do some and another evaluator to do another is certainly possible. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't envision that it would probably start that way. What would probably happen is that one person or um, Dr. Perez might be at an initial meeting for the discussion, and then if she were going to be gone, she would have participated in sort of determining what assessments were felt to be necessary, but someone else could potentially be conducting those evaluations. And also, is there, do we have a, um, like a history of, of how many recommendations come in around that time of year, historically? I, I do not, no. off the top of my head. I, I don't know what history you can give. I would say that the second, half of the school year, we tend to see um, an, a spike in referrals um, as, you know, as, as it's getting closer to the end of the year, um, teachers' level of concern about individual students may rise, parents' level of concern about their children may rise, we may see um, different challenges presented by, by students with respect to behavior or mm -hmm. um, a deterioration academically, and so those things can provoke a, an increase in referrals. Typically around March, I would say, is when you, you see that spike. I know, um, you know, if someone saw this, and maybe this was, a, a, you know, my child's teacher, someone would say, wow, 18 days, that's a long time for, you know, a teacher who, you know, given the relationship they've developed with students, um, you know, given it might be at the end of the year, depending on what age they are, they may have assessments. Um, you know, contrast how that type of situation is maybe different than some of the work Dr. Perez does. Does she have... Um, you know, everyday interaction with the student, that, that continuity might be something you weigh more heavily on than if it was a regular instruction teacher? I, I would say in general, no. Uh, the role of a psychologist tends to be one, and particularly this year, as, as she described, um, because she's the sole um, psychologist in-house full-time, that it, it tends to be moving back and forth, you know, working with different students on different days to conduct evaluations, participating in meetings at different buildings. There isn't that um, ongoing one-to-one -one relationship, typically. At times, those things can happen where psychologists may be providing direct consultation or support um, to individual students. But in this particular year and with the particular caseloads, that isn't an, an ongoing um, relationship challenge, or there isn't an ongoing relationship that would be challenged. Yeah, I was just trying to think of the threshold for, you know, how um, whenever a, a staff member's out, there's also obviously an impact on student or learning, and our role is to, you know, weigh the cost benefit, where if a teacher was out for 18 days, it would be significant, you know, you'd have to get a substitute given the timing, but given her role, would you say it would be less of an impact on, on student? Um, just trying to understand, you know, given there's lots of different roles in how to weigh the, the cost um, benefit this versus if a, a, a regular instruction teacher. So, thank you. But there would be a cost to, we would need a replacement. Um, we would need to contract a person on a, for the 18 days. Again, would we not be able to clearly project what the demands for evaluation or meetings might be at that time. I, it's certainly conceivable that there would be some need for contracting. Can I say that it would be every single day of the 18? Probably not. Um, while it wouldn't be ideal, um, you know, I'm, Dr. Perez would should be able to interact, um, you know, if there was consultation. 
um, you know, communicate. I mean, I know it'd be harder. You would, you'd want to focus on the where you are, but if there was a need, uh, you know, could she consult if there was some situation? I can't speak uh, uh, with any level of confidence to the technological capacities of that particular school <laughs> or the, its infrastructure. Um, we have some, we know some information at the school, but she hasn't visited it. Certainly they have a web presence and an internet presence, and we presume that they are technologically capable. Are things going to align in terms of just time alone that make that possible? I don't know. Would she be available to us if we needed to contact her about a specific issue? I would assume so. If, I'm sorry. Before you do, if you wouldn't mind coming up to the podium, because I hate to do that to you, but um, the reason is that if you're not talking into the microphone, then no one who's watching can hear you. So I appreciate it. Thank yep. you. Um, I can address the prior point, and um, off the top of my head, I believe thus far through the school year, I've probably completed 12 to 13 evaluations, and we've contracted out only for three thus far. So just to give you a sense of the workload, and um, when I say covering all bases, I'm really trying to cover all bases as much as possible and minimize um, the expenses of the outside contractors doing evaluations. So as I look through the whole year and what I know I have for evaluations and what I can foresee having been here, it's my ninth year, the flow of how these come in, um, I saw that time of the year as really having the least impact on the district. So that addresses the point. Well, I had a, sorry, go ahead. No, on a, on a fiscal note, <clears throat> do we normally have another site? Yes. Staff. Yes, we do. And is that psychologist currently out on unpaid leave? Yes, I believe so. I don't know the details of it. Okay. So we're already down. Well, we're down one, but we're also down having to pay her salary. Is it true? It's a maternity leave, the leave of absence that was requested, childbearing leave is unpaid. She actually, I mean, she's actually doing contracting, consulting. I'm just hearing that the 18 days seems um, like a new precedent for us. And setting that precedent may put um, us in an awkward position for future requests. And I'm wondering if you would entertain um, any other options in your request to sort of make it financially more um, palatable for the district to support. Absolutely, yeah. This is my first time doing this, so um, I'm open to ideas, and I'm not sure how these things do work or could work, so, yeah. What, did you have things in mind, or I don't know, at, like sick days or personal days, or? Well, I, I don't think that you would be allowed to use sick days for something like this. Of course, I don't know what our HR policy is, but I'm just assuming so. Um, it, it, sort of maybe a... I'm proposing perhaps if you want to come back to us with a different financial arrangement other than the full 18 days, maybe something more in line with traditional paid leave requests that we received for um, professional development, if that was something that you would be interested in entertaining. Which, I'm sorry, Joe, didn't, I think we heard that like the average uh, pers you know, personal development days that are covered can be covered are about three to five days. Um, right. <clears throat> so it, it seems that, uh, from, from my perspective, that would be the, the ballpark um, to shoot for. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, that's what I intended to say. Did I say something? I think, and I think it's within our power to amend the <coughs> um, request. Can we fix the feedback? <laughs> well, I would just say the only thing. Um, the motion was for 18 days, and I think I wouldn't want to put someone, uh, Dr. Perez, in a position to negotiate against herself. Right. In other words, if she says, well, yes, you know, I could do, you know, um, if we said, well, could you do 14? Then someone said, well, how about 10? So how about 8? <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I don't want to put her in that position. So either. Us asking the feasibility. So just to give a little background to. 
But this is a fellowship, so um, it's typically six to eight weeks in length. Um, they are only able to provide for one fellow at a time. They already have another fellow coming during the summer months, which is something I considered, so that was impossible. So that's why I was trying to go with their requirements for a six to eight week fellowship placement that really benefits their school, but also can benefit my professional development. So I was trying to minimize the impact on the district, trying to schedule it at the end of the year and not impinge on what they already have for a fellow there coming in um, and still have it be of use to us and to them. And so trying to, yeah. So that's why I selected that time period and those number of days. And um, if I could have done it another way, I would have done that. <laughs> so they're not in session over Christmas break. So just trying to maximize as much as they can get a summer vacation. So. Uh, one thing we could do, one way to move forward, would be if, for someone to amend the motion, we can vote on the, you know, we can vote on the amended motion, and, and um, if, uh, you know, if, if, if that changes the proposal, I don't know how much time you have, um, but if that changes the proposal that, you know, you know that you would, um, you know, if that means you would have to come back to the board for, you know, with a, with a, with a different proposal than, you know, that, then you would at least have the guidance of, of an amended motion. Um, so that's, if someone has a, 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 an amendment to the motion, we could move forward that way. <clears throat> I, have, I haven't heard an answer to one question. And that is, um, leaving aside the issue of money, leaving aside the issue of precedent, I, I guess, I just have a question, maybe you're the best one to answer it. If you're, you're the only one here, you've been doing the work of almost two people, you're gone for 18 days, suppose something comes up, how do we handle it? What coverage do we get? Well, things don't usually pop up that quickly with my role. Um, we tend to have some kind of foresight with things coming down the, the path. Um, so. Um, in that sense, I think it actually probably would be with those short number of days left in the school would be something we could probably plan for. There wouldn't, it would be atypical for a surprise to pop up in those last three weeks of school. Um, it has not happened in my tenure here. If that's what you're asking. Yeah, I, I was concerned um, um, if something, we, we have no coverage as far as I can tell once you're gone. Well, we, if, if, if I, and I have no idea about what historical usage is. It's not like electricity that you can predict it. Um, so the question would be, what's the risk our, our kids and our school districts are taking? If you're gone, there's nobody there. And if, if you're gone, there's nobody there, is there, I don't know if you know about availability. If you're saying it's rare, and if, but if the rare thing occurs, is there availability in the marketplace to have a, a contracted person? I don't know if you know that. We, we do have a couple contractors that we use um, on a regular basis and I've worked with over the past several years and those people are here in place and kind of consulting and working with us at this point. So we do have those people to draw on during that time period. Is and there, I'm, I'm sorry, is there some way to get commitments out of those people that they can cover if something happens? Uh, I can't speak on their behalf. I don't know the details of the contracts they have with the district or whatnot, so yeah. <laughs> I don't no, see why not, but I, I can't speak on their behalf. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't speak any better than uh, uh, Dr. Perez can about their availability. I, you know, typically, contractors are working sometimes in multiple places simultaneously. So uh, again, what it comes down to is trying to be able to provide as much <coughs> advance notice to those people as possible when we anticipate a need coming. And as, as she suggested, again, when we have an evaluation, we talked about that sort of 45-day window. So if there's a new evaluation, we've got 45 days from the time the referral is made or the evaluation request is made in order to conduct that evaluation. So again, presumably we would know more than 18 days before the end of the school year that we need to conduct that evaluation. Well, say that again? The, the, the last sentence that we would we would know more than 18 days prior to the end of the school year. I suppose you know, we're on 19, you, you have one day to do it. So we have 45 days to make a plan. But we don't have a person. Um, that's what I'm, I'm trying and to And that's what about. I'm saying. We would, we would 
know enough in advance that we should be able to find out whether or not someone is available. Can I guarantee that people are available within that time frame? I cannot. Can I guarantee that a need will arise? I cannot. Well, it also doesn't mean we have to take 45 school days to get it done right. as well. So. Okay. I'm, I'm just trying to, uh, um, other people have raised questions about money and pricing. I'm, I'm more, I'm just thinking about the, the job, the very, very, very important job that you're doing and we don't have backup. That's just my question. And you reassured me to a certain extent by 10 years of experience, these rarely come up issues that need immediate attention in the last 18 days of the school year. And the only question then is whether or not, what do we do with the one time in 10 years or one time in 11 years or whatever. But well, we, we do have backup. We have contractors that we work with and they're regularly in the district and I work with them and have relationships with them and so I just can't speak to their availability for those particular 18 days. Mm -hmm. I haven't planned for that Meredith? possibility. Well, I was just going to sort of summarize. This is a difficult issue for a board. I, underst I think we understand that. On the one hand, you want to support professionals and taking risks and trying new things and an opportunity to visit another culture and experience life in a school system in another country is a, is a fabulous opportunity. On the other hand, you're raising concerns about what's the financial obligation, are we going to be able to honor our commitment to students, and, and it, what is the cost of this, um, both in real dollar terms as well as the impact on students, and how do you balance that? And, uh, I don't, I don't think there's an easy answer for that, you know, for those questions. I, I, I think you're weighing those pieces. The issue of precedence David raised, again, you know, right now you have one person before you making a request for what is an exciting fellowship opportunity, but you could have someone else making a similar request a year from now, but you might not. I mean, these are, these are the kinds of challenges that we wrestle with. There isn't a particular policy or contract language that governs this decision. So I would say you, you have options to approve the 18 days in full as requested, which was the original, that's the motion on the table. You could look at some sort of interim position, which is what I think I heard suggested by Joe, um, saying where you offer potentially some of those days as paid leave you could offer a, an unpaid leave. So I mean, essentially, I think those are your, your options. And again, I, there are a lot of things that you're balancing. I think you know, we understand that. Obviously, Alina is hopeful that, that the opportunities to pursue the goals identified in the mission and vision are, are resonating with you. But, but you know, I think we also understand that you have a governance role that you need to play, so. Can I suggest another option, too? Another option is to make up some of those days during the summer. There's nothing that bars us from doing evaluations during the summer. I've done them before with students. Um, so that's another option too, to make up some days during the summer months. Is there an option to, to, to postpone the fellowship for a year um, and do it during the summer? I understand that for next summer, the summer months, some, they had a fellow. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you're eager to go. I, I, Meredith's right. We've, the reason we're wrestling with this is we find your, your opportunity compelling. Um, but I'm mindful of the, the fact that teachers work, and, and I think you, you do too, um, 185 days a year, which leaves you know, about, 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 eight, about, sorry, my math is... L less than 185. About, about, about 80 weekdays, um, <laughs> I think, 60 to 80 weekdays you know, during the year when um, when you know teachers aren't working, when they can make, when when this kind of professional development opportunity is available without a lot of the questions that we you know that we, that that are concerning us tonight. So, is that a possibility, or is is this your only shot at this fellowship, or you don't know because I don't know, somebody, right? I don't know. Yeah. Just one know. recurring theme is, uh, or one question, um, you'd have to go for 18 days. You couldn't, you know, it's either, if you're going to go for 18, it wouldn't matter. You, could you go for fewer days? Uh, I think they would be willing. In my conversations with the um, U.S. based liaison, Sherry, Sherry Dixine, Dr. Sherry Dixine, um, 
sounds like they would be willing to consider as few as four weeks. They do not have school the last week in June. So um, I'd have to look in a calendar. I can't do that um, right. in my head. So that's, that's a possibility. I could ask her about but the, But the choices are, you know, go for three days or go for 18. In other words, if you're going, you know, it's 18 days. So regardless of all the other issues, it's, you know, 18 days. Um, so, um, you know, I, my view of it in terms of precedence and all that, it's you look at each situation on its own. If it was a regular instruction teacher that was going to be out of the classroom for four weeks, I would have a much higher sensitivity to that. It'd be hard to tell someone that's not going to impact the students in the classroom. But given Dr. Perez's role, she's articulated the nature of her work. Um, you know, there is a... Uh, someone else who can do the evaluation. There's always uncertainties, but I think it's manageable. And you know, I um, think it's a great opportunity, and given the fact that it, it's uh, her role within the school system, it's different than a regular instruction teacher and impacting students. Um, either she goes for the 18 days or zero. Um, you know, so I don't think there's anything in, in between on that. Um, so. If we're not going to make an uh, amendment, I would like to vote on the, the proposal before us. Is there any discussion or can we call the motion? I, I would like to say two things. One, uh, um, I don't want to take the credit for coming up with the precedent one because I think in the past I've taken the position that each case should be decided on its own. So I agree with Michael. Um, and a couple of those decisions didn't turn out great, but I, um, I guess I'm more reassured than I was earlier about the risk to students. If, um, but there is still some risk. Um, and that's really my, my, my main focus is, is for the coverage for the kids as opposed to three days or 18 days, that, that's really my focus. And soon you've had 10 years of experience and really nothing has come up in the last 18 days, carry some weight with me. And I wish I knew whether or not these contracted people could handle the emergency, which I don't know. Um, I, I would feel a lot more reassured about, I, I, would, I would, that's my main concern, I guess is what I would say. I'm less concerned about 18 versus three to five. I'm more concerned about coverage. And I think I've heard that's been reasonably well answered. So, okay. so as I stand here thinking, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this in this forum, but you had um, offered if there are other um, ways to work this. I have some personal days, and again, the offer to make up some of those days in the summer months and conduct some of the evaluations that may or may not come up during that time period. Um, again, we're not bound to have to take 45 school days. We can do them in a short time period. So that's something that I can offer here standing on the top of my head. <laughs> so I see that there's a number of ways that we could be creative in balancing this amazing opportunity with the financial needs of the district as well as the needs of our students, which clearly seem to be met. I mean, um, no, no one can guarantee the availability of anyone else, especially if they're not here in this room to say so, but it seems like there's a, at least some contractors that we have in place that we've been working with in the district. So I feel comfortable in the aspect of the, our students will be covered. I'm trying to wrestle with, in my mind, um, yes, we do need to, uh, look at each of these requests on its own merit, but I think we also need to be fiscally responsible to our taxpayers in, in what it is we're supporting what we've been doing. And this clearly does strike our heartstrings when it comes to being bold and moving after that global connection and the opportunities that you could then open up for that, um, for our, our district and our students are also equally valuable. Um, 
I don't know if I'm ready to give a thumbs up or down on a straight 18 days without exploring some other options, and I don't know how to move forward with that. And by that you mean straight 18 paid days, because I'm getting the sense from the board that we're okay with the 18 days. It's the 18 paid days that we're wrestling. Correct. I'm absolutely thrilled for this opportunity for you. I'm just trying to figure out a way that's um, just responsible and and looking at options and making sure that we're looking and exploring all options before we jump in to 18 paid days. Dr. Perez, you, you said, I think, uh, I believe in your letter to the board that a pending approval from the school, then you would then go to C. Um, do you need approval for the paid 18 days before you go to C, or do you need just approval for the 18 days away? Um, I, I thought it, un I, I cannot go on this fellowship without um, having salary because there's no, there's no stipend provided by the school. There's no reimbursement for travel. There's nothing provided except for living expenses when I'm there. So um, going to see if it would be something I would go um, in terms of travel funds, but I thought that unwise until it was approved by the school board. Seemed like putting the cart before the horse, the horse before the cart. <laughs> right. I guess I'd like to see, you know, if you have available um, personal days. I don't know if there are any other kinds of, um, I know uh, as part of the collective bargaining unit, there are not vacation days. Um, but if there are other, um, if there's personal days or other, uh, you know, uh, uh, paid time off uh, opportunities that, the, you know, that, that, that those would be exhausted before, you know, the district was expending resources. Um, you know, to, 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 in terms of pay, paid days. And, the um, other, and I don't know, you know, we don't know what those are, so I, I don't know how to amend the motion on that basis. Um, but um, I, I'd certainly be more comfortable if, you know, if, if those, that kind of time was being used toward this. Um, and I know there's been a precedent for that in the district when people were looking for more time than, than a professional development days allowed. They, they contributed um, uh, their professional development days and their and and um, personal days toward toward that, those sorts of efforts. Um, yeah, I'd but, be happy to do that. I, I don't know the details of the contract either, off the top of my head. So, and I'm also curious to hear what type of um, even just if it's a short number of days, what type of um, guarantee that there would be work for you to do for those days over the summer? Oh, there's work. <laughs> okay. There, I've, yeah, either I, myself, or someone else has done work over the summer pretty consistently. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, so I, I would ask whether you have time to come back to us with a proposal that would include, um, that would include personal days and, and you know, co uh, comp days. Um, that would might that might reduce the the number of paid time days off that had to be um, contributed to the effort mm -hmm. uh, to something closer to the you know to the, the typical three to five days that the district has has contributed to to um, professional development. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be willing to do that. Yeah. What's your time frame, though, in terms of committing to? This? Um, I think just in terms of planning for the travel, it would definitely be in the next month at the most. Yeah, yeah, there's some, a lot of visas and details and it gets more expensive the longer I wait. Right, so, yeah. so we, meet, we, we meet again next month, but not, a, not actually at our usual time, we meet on the 18th instead of the 11th because it's better in this day. Uh -huh. Is that so, so that would be our next opportunity to I think we can give it a try. There's no other option to meet earlier, so we can give it a try. Um, well, some of those questions, do, do we already know the answers? In terms of allowable personal days in the contract, there are two. All right, so that's two. I have four right now, though. And then the other ones? There aren't other unpaid days or comp days that are part of the bargaining agreement, so it would be whether or not there was a some sort of arrangement for work during the summer, which would, I think, require some conversation with the director of instructional support. Mm -hmm. 
Is there an ability to, um, you know, once we have all the data uh, to meet before the 18th? Um, or does it have to be a public session at that point? It has to be, a, it has to be, a, we need to vote in a public uh, okay. meeting, but we do, we are coming together for a workshop on the 28th of October and we could Mm -hmm. Can we schedule a special, a special business meeting at that time um, if does that give you enough time yeah oh yeah um, so I I would I think then we need a motion to table the motion right is that, is that how we do it um, until uh, until we can look at it again um, with, with some consideration for uh, personal and comp time. You can table the motion or you could withdraw the motion. Or you can oh. deny it without prejudice. There's 19 different ways to do it. Okay. I don't want to deny, want to deny it at all because that's not the message no. I want to give. I want to give if we could table it because it's exciting. You just need to work with um, you. It's a really unique opportunity, and as I think about it, I'm almost a little bit nervous to do it because it requires so much translation of my skills. It's a, full, it's a fully English-speaking school, but to translate it through that cultural lens is its a huge learning opportunity for me, and I know it will really push my skills to the limit, so, yeah. We know you wouldn't be asking it unless it was a serious, yeah. and um, so that's why I just don't want to say no to it. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, David. I know David pulled something else out of his pocket. I'm sorry. I'm I think we should just table it. So I, I would I would move that we table the motion. I second. Unless, unless you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All those. But is there enough time, um, or could you make a motion? Um, you know, approve request for 18 days of leave um, with. 12 days of uh, paid leave, and then, uh, you know. How do you get 12? I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with 12 uh, days, so. I, I, I'd like to see some options, just because we okay. need to do our due diligence. Okay. Well, I'm just saying we need to, you know, is it, should we tell her now, you know, is it four, is it 18? I'm just a big fan. I, think I give. We want to see what's what's possible, Michael. That's okay. I mean, uh, we could. <laughs> now you're putting us in a position of negotiating with ourselves. Uh, just give. <laughs> I think guidance. You know, is it? I understand. I, I, but what guidance can what, the guidance we can give is that we we, we know that we've uh, granted three to yeah. five days professional development, guidance. paid professional development time in the past. Um, you know that that's been something that we've done um we we it sounds like the board um you know has concerns about coverage but isn't going to object to the t uh the you know um hopes that we can manage that and isn't going to object to the total number of days um and you know wants to see whether we can whether there's a creative proposal that um you know helps helps cover some of the the, the costs and get some of that work which is clearly on your plate, you know, to make sure that that work is, is getting done. Um, and so, you know, I, to me, that's enough guidance to, to, you know, to come back to us. And you'll have to come back and you'll have to exp explain it again and, and, you know, and, but I, I hope that that gives us a way to move forward. John, I just also want to say congratulations, you know, because this is an honor uh, that's sort of been lost in the, in the, in this. this is, it's great. And I think that we're all, we all want to say, yes, you know, go. Um, and thank you for seeking out these opportunities. It's another thing. So I, we just, we need to find a way to be able to say yes. That's... How many students can you take with you? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Can we go to? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no. uh, Thank you. A mo so once again, I'm going to move to table the motion. Seconded. And it's been and seconded. seconded. Yeah. OK. So all those in favor of tabling the motion? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, item seven. Do we have any committee chairs with reports to give tonight? Well, I'm not the committee chair, but I want to um, remind policy is going to hope tomorrow night. So tomorrow night is Thursday night. Thursday night at 7. 7 in the library. 7 at the library. Is it in the library? No, 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 no. It's at Community Services. Thing. So Joe is going to uh, present the new policies, the first read at the HOPE meeting. And so um, it's a great time for people to come and um, talk about the policies, hear them, um, and ask some questions directly. So I think. Thank you, Kate. I'm not the chair of evaluations, but the biggest job I'm trying to do now is get everybody scheduled to get together again soon. There's a lot of work to do. And that's, we're trying to find a way to do it. That's the ongoing work on creating an evaluation structure for teacher and administrators. Yes. Thank you for doing that. Um, are there any other, did you have an update, Michael? We might as well do teacher evaluations with the help of that's, that's what I just said. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Quickly did. That were negotiations. Sorry. All right. Community Services Advisory Commission. Or is that just that's an upcoming meeting? That's an upcoming meeting. I always cross this. I know. They're all the same. We should put those together. Uh, item eight: School Board Agenda Requests. Um, one came in from you today, Kate, regarding. Uh, the issues around charter schools. Yep. Um, I, we just got that today, so you know, let's 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 talk. Perfect. Um, the goal is to have a good good understanding in the community around around the issues associated with charter schools. Who can go? When can they come back? It, the answer to that is they can come, they can always come back. We we welcome them back with, <laughs> with open arms. Um, and open minds. Yes. And open, and doors. open doors. Yes. And doors. <laughs> um, are there other school board agenda requests? Um, one, one that's uh, been come to my attention by a couple people is again a, a focusing on um, making sure the transition from eighth to ninth is as good as it can be, and and whether or not. Um, the high school staff, the high school teachers of incoming freshmen um, are in communication with the middle school, eighth grade, and, and are, are they getting the students, um, are the students landing with them as best they can per the high school staff um, and also per the student entering. So just focusing more deeply in the um, transition period and preparation for beginning now in eighth grade where they go to high school. Uh, that's a perennial issue and one we, we have given some attention to in, in uh, workshop format. Um, I can't recall the date exactly of that, of that workshop, but um, uh, last year? Last or spring. spring, it could have been spring. I don't have that list in front of me. I don't, I don't have it in front of me either. Um, but thank you for that. Uh, okay, item nine, announcements, uh, announcements of upcoming meetings. Joe. Um, so I want to uh, make sure that everyone knows that the Community Services Advisory Committee also meets tomorrow night, which is why I now hope didn't meet tomorrow night, because that's another night. Um, uh, 6.30 in the Community Services Building, and we will be reviewing the community survey on um, sort of a needs assessment of what the community is looking for. And there's an exciting opportunity to combine our, the community services needs assessment along with the assessment that the um, committee that is looking at senior citizens in our community and what their needs are. So we're gonna be combining those efforts, which is really exciting moving forward. So. Um, Come on and give us your feedback on what you would like to see assessed. Thank you. That's tomorrow night? Yes, okay. 6.30, community services. Okay, thanks, Joe. Other upcoming meetings? October 30th is the last library um, planning meeting, built library, Thomas Memorial Library Building Committee meeting before the vote. And then 
We'll see what happens with the committee after the vote. But um, thank October you for 30th. your very many hours uh, representing <laughs> school Jeff. district issues on on, on, on that committee is, and yours as well. Um, the school board workshop is October 28th. We will the the subject will be special education. Uh, we were scheduled to meet with the Community Services Advisory Committee, but we can't meet with them then. Um, so we will do that at another date. Um, and so we will, we'll, we'll, we had special education was on the agenda anyway, so we're pushing that forward. Next policy and, meeting is November 3rd. Okay. I should probably write it. Be there, be smart. Uh, item 10, may I have a motion? Sorry. Just before you do that, sorry, but I just wanted to make sure to remind folks again that the next regular business meeting will be on the 18th of November, ah, because you. Tuesday the 11th, the second Tuesday when our usual business meetings are held is, a veteran, is the Veterans Day holiday. So that November 18th meeting will not be televised, it will be held at the high school library. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, hopefully there's something else on television that night. <laughs> you can watch for you until this council meeting. Uh, okay, <laughs> item 10. Uh, we adjourn. I second. It. <laughs> All those in favor? Seven. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you all.